morning, everybody. Um, let's make it very interactive. I think the idea is obviously for this is an opportunity for you to talk um, uh, around some of the requirements that you've got, the questions you've got, and I'll try and touch on some of the other things as well uh, that I think is relevant. I think just uh, for some of you, just a heads up, um, not everybody knows Stanford is a business as well. I think what's interesting is that Stanford Precincts nowadays has got a lot of people working there, and you might say, why so many people? It's because the world has changed a lot. Um, we've seen uh, so the money that we talk about today is made basically by Victor and his team also, um, and myself, um, but people like Hansky and Kate also play important roles. I think the only thing I want to point out is that we've employed a team of people here uh, called Stand Up Credit Partners, and the reason why we employ that team is to make sure that we've got people in terms of the new regulations. Regulation 28 now allows you to have a lot of unlisted or not conventional credit in your portfolios, so does uh, Notice 80, which is the old Cisco regulation that run the regulations for unit trust, allows for unlisted credit. So this team of people here are basically looking after credit. That's their main function. Uh, and they look after credit, which is typically bank credit, not the type of credit that Kate will look after, which is uh, bank, uh, state-owned enterprises, major corporates. These guys will look at things like unlisted companies, bank loans, specific transactions that comes off bank balance sheets. Interesting how the world has evolved. Eight years ago, we were eight people and one credit analyst. Today, we're 15 people with seven credit analysts. So, uh, and maybe there's some good news. We have gone from 160 billion to 170 billion in the last quarter. So, uh, we picked up quite a bit of assets under management. Um, Standard manages uh, 110. Excuse me. Manages 110 billion rand with the money market assets. Now, that's quite significant because it makes us 33% of the money market in South Africa. And we were in that position before, we dropped back a little bit, we've grown again. And I really think uh, the fact that we're such a large player across all the different asset classes is, is, is quite powerful. And I keep saying it always is that one of the things that we can do nowadays as a business is we go to issuers and we ask them to do specific deals for us. So we can go to a, a good top quality name and say, we'd like to do a 500 million transaction with you. We very recently, last week, concluded a transaction with an issuer, and that's the type of paper that we would put in the fund, the income fund, which is the fund we're talking about today, and some of that paper did find its way to that fund. So we initially they sold their paper at 135 over Jaiba, we bought that paper at 162 basis points over Jaiba. So that's quite a nice uplift, and that's only because we can go directly to the issuer, and do an off-market transaction. Okay, so let's talk about the fund that we're going to talk about today. It's fixed interest we manage money from long to short. Uh, we've always tried to be a provider in all the different uh, spheres of fixed interest. And the idea is for us to be really um, a, a, a solution across the whole curve. Now, it's very really powerful to be a solution <coughs> provider across the curve because you're not only sitting there monitoring certain sectors of the market, you actually know what's going on. So let me give you an example. If you buy a five-year zero, you know whether the bank that you're buying it from is funding or not because you've checked with all the other banks. Now, if we pick up that certain banks are selling more aggressively five-year zeros, it means that we probably could go back to them and bid them more aggressively for one year in CDs. So it's integrating the information that you get across the different markets to make sure that all our, all our portfolios benefit from the same information. Today we're going to talk about the aggressive fund. It's a fund that's managed by, by a collective team of people, but mainly myself and Keenan are very actively involved in managing that fund and the fixing just team that standard. But before we get to that, let's talk about the world. Now, obviously the first question everybody asks me is where is rates going to go? Now the blue, the light blue line is the forecast from standard. We think rates are going to be flat. If you listen to what Bernanke said last night, he said rates will now be at very low levels until 2015. And I don't want to be a pessimist, but the reality is most of us in this room will have to accept that short rates are going to be lower for much, much longer than all of us ever expected it to be. You know, we've got to these low levels, and it doesn't look like rates are going to go up, and rates are probably going to be uh, going sideways for a very, very long time. What does that mean? It means that real rates have now gone negative. Yesterday, the inflation came up 5.5%. We know that the repo rate is at 5%. Most money market funds has got all kinds of 
good instruments in them are only giving you five and a half percent before any cost. So being in the money market is not the place to be, particularly if this is a perpetual situation that goes no problem. The perpetual situation going forward in South Africa. The dark blue line is what the market is forecasting. So the market, to a certain extent, that's the Praka, the Ford rate, the green rate, is looking for a potential cut still probably late this year, early next year. I think the inflation number from yesterday is probably put a little bit of breaks on that. But that will be very much dependent on how the world develops as an economy going forward. We know a number of emerging markets have cut rates, so we can't ignore that. But uh, in South Africa, we think rates will be flat uh, for a very, very long period of time. So I'm going to touch on a couple of things that we use in bonds to um, look at the world and try and un better understand what drives the outcomes of our markets. Because the one thing that's quite certain is since South Africa got included in this world government bond index, our relationship with the emerging markets has become much, much bigger. And you'll see this theme of our correlation with other emerging markets quite strong <coughs> in the presentation today. So what we've got here is the red line is the FA spread and the blue <coughs> is the MB spread over the equivalent US treasuries. And we can clearly see that what happens in emerging markets tend to happen in South Africa. However, not always perfectly correlated, but there seems to be a very good correlation in those numbers. And we monitor that all the time. The other thing that we thought we just had got on top of it is to look at the VIX, which is the blue line. Now, the VIX is the volatility index of the uh, US stock exchange. Now, the VIX is published daily and uh, has been trading around 18 to 15 for a long period of time. It sits on that axis on that side. The other line is the red line is the, is the RAND exchange rate. And you can clearly see from this line that for a long time, whatever risk off or risk on trade happened in the world seemed to have been to the RAND. Very disappointing is the fact that the RAND has weakened while the VIX lately has been performing. And that's indicative of this whole situation that we've got in South Africa with our current account has come under pressure, we've obviously had some other issues in our economy, and the reality of that is that we've seen us drift away as a, as a risk appetite increase in the world. We've not seen the same thing that has come to South Africa. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It means that we potentially are a little bit cheaper on a relative basis. Don't forget that. So the other thing that we obviously must touch on today is what's happening in Europe. Because the four major economies in the world are doing the following. In Japan, Debt to GDP, 250%. Japan has to, to refinance their debt annually, has to refinance 59%, the equivalent of 59% of their GDP has to be issued in debt. So think about the South African economy, 3 trillion economy, so about 2 trillion or 2 billion rands worth of debt has to be financed annually. That's the equivalent of what they have to do in Japan. So the Japanese situation is quite bad. We know that America and both the UK are in quite good debt situations. Why? Because they've got a printing press. They have the ability to guarantee you that they'll give you back your money at the end. However, Europe cannot do that. And that's why Europe is in a different position. Europe, interest rates have been moving sideways and they've been very close together. So we've seen Italian and Spanish debt go up. German and French debt come down. Let's see how the gap between French debt has lagged German debt recently. I'm just going to move a little bit quicker. So, so what we've got here is, if you look at the flows into emerging markets, and this is to the number that we saw, the purple bars is Australia, the Panama bars is Mexico, Brazil has had good inflows until 2010. Why did it stop? Because they introduced these capital requirements. You've got to put 6% sacrifice down before you can get into the economy. So suddenly all the money dried up. But South Africa, the green bars have seen quite nice flows into our country. If you look at emerging markets as a whole, all emerging markets have seen inflows. So on the left-hand side, you've got the bond flows. Since the crisis, all economies have seen bond inflows. Since the crisis, all economies saw initial equity flows, and since then it's weighed off. So South Africa, similar to the rest of the world in South Africa, is the dark green. So we've actually not done too bad compared to some of these other economies on equities, although our equities are down about. Uh, 16 odd billion uh, for the year today. Foreign real estate have bought roughly 80 plus billion of bonds in South Africa. So one of the things that we picked up is that since the introduction of the weekly, our correlation, as I said earlier, is very strong to international markets. It used to be about 60 odd percent, so what happens in the rest of the world happens here. 
Nowadays, that correlation is over 80%. So our, wor our world has become foreign dominated. So when somebody sees something happening in Turkey, you better be aware of it because our market is going to move because of what's happening in Turkey. Because if he's selling Turkey, he's going to be selling South Africa as well. So just looking at it differently, initially over the last number of years, up to about 2007, mainly equity flows coming into South Africa. Then obviously 2008 was not a good year for emerging markets in general. And then since then we see this massive pickup in equity, uh, into bond markets, which is the red bars there. If you put it differently, we can let see that since 2004, bonds have now really picked up to the extent that they represent about the same amounts of money that's coming into our economy. We always think of foreigners only as plays into our equity market and having bought some bonds, but they've actually now bought nearly as many bonds as they bought equity over time. Uh, and this is a bit of detail, but this, for those of you who are interested, this shows you the different areas on the curve where <coughs> foreigners have bought assets. Now, if you can clearly see that foreigners have bought quite a bit of assets in the very long end of the curve. Now, the long end of the curve is actually only a smaller portion of the index compared to the 7 to 12 year. They even bought some long dated inflation in bonds. Now, that's a good sign because it means they've got confidence because somebody who's buying 12 year plus bonds must have confidence in the economy to go and buy assets of those terms. Another thing that we look at is the difference between the SA economy uh, in terms of rates to the US. So you can see that historically we've traded up to 6 and probably slightly below 5, but we're sitting at the 5% level as a differential. So that's not a very really good sign of over or undervaluation at the moment. We monitor the swap spreads. So we, what we do there is the swap spread is the world with a bank <coughs> in fixed and floating rate of transactions. I'm not going to dwell into much detail, but the point I'm trying to make is by looking at the difference between the 2 and the 10 year, gives you an idea of the shape of the curve. And we see this curve slowly drift up, and then in the very recent past, that curve has actually now gone even a little bit more steeper. So um, as we move in the sideways environment, the tail of the curve is standing up a little bit more, and it, pre it represents a better yield for those willing to buy assets at the slightly long end of the curve. The other thing that we also look at is the swap curve relative to the bond curve. Now, this is very technical, but what I'm saying is that we've seen when foreigners participated in a market initially, the swap curve trades below the bond curve. Now, that was indicative of foreigners coming to our market, not putting money down, buying the swap instead of the bond, and thereby driving the swap, which is bank issue paper below the government curve. So think about it. You can buy an instrument, fixed rate instrument from a bank, at a more expensive price than you can buy from government. And it shouldn't be like that. We should think government is the risk to rate. Now it's normalized recently, and that's because initially a lot of the money that came from South Africa was fast money. So the announcement of the week becomes, and a trade in London, what is he say? Well, I better buy some of this because somebody else will want to buy it later on anyway. So they think don't uh, buy some assets. And now recently we've seen more uh, real money coming into our market. So if we just recap what has happened in the last few years. <coughs> the blue line is basically the yield curve. We talk about the yield curve at the end of 2010. Quite a flattish yield curve. And if you remember back in 2005-06, we had inverse yield curves in this country. So after the sell-off that we had in the RAND in 06-07, short rates were higher than where long rates were. It was a no-brainer. You just put your money in the money market. Nowadays, a little bit more tricky because at the end of last year, that's the green line, and nowadays we've gone to the red line. So it's a quite a steep opportunity. Being invested here is quite risky because you're not meeting inflation. The question that you've got to ask yourself today is where do you want to be invested on this line in order to match the opportunity of higher yield with the risk profile that you want to assume? So one of the things that we've included in the aggressive income fund is inflation in bonds. Now why I'm showing you this is that at Standard, we've got a guy called Robert Milburn and he did some work for us specifically on inflation in bonds. And what is very powerful is we found specifically the area of inflation bonds that were going to perform well. So we went at two, around about 240. We bought a lot of inflation bonds of specifically this red and the purple one. It's 2023, 2022 inflation bonds. And you can really see how they outperform relative to other longer dated inflation bonds. Now, the technicalities why did they do so well? Uh, the government stopped issuing short dated inflation bonds. Banks issued inflation in paper about a, three or four years ago, 
and they needed to buy a hedge against those papers that they issued. And what happened is that there's a chair up front here. Uh, there's a, there was a big demand for banks to roll their, their, their position, but at the same time there was no supply because government was only issuing longer than they were facing one. So that's the perfect situation. You want to buy the thing that's going to be in demand of which there's no supply. And I think Keenan does that really well in his game as well. So this is how real yields are performed. Now, remember, real yields are the spread over inflation that these bonds will pay you over a long period of time. And we can see how this red line has performed. While the very long end is not really similar to where the rates have been in the past. And one of the other things that we do is we look at the value that foreigners look at in terms of how they judge our market. Now, this is a slide that many of you might have seen, and we keep updating it because it's important to look at our long-term RSA inflation, the bond minus the inflation rate, we do the same for the US, we get a differential there, and we simply add to that the US bond yield and the SA sovereign spread, and you get to a rate. Now, if you compare that to a current 10-year bond yield, it means we are exactly where <coughs> fair value is in the mind of a foreigner. If we make an assumption, and that's what we do at Standard, it's a continuous thing to say, where, we, where do we think the future can go to? One of the scenarios is that this scenario changes with the rates going up in the US. Our current situation is deteriorating ever so slightly. This rate can come under pressure. And that's obviously some of the things that Keenan will then use in his scenario as, call it the Berry scenario of where rates potentially can go to under certain circumstances. The other thing that we do is we look at the cash break even. And that's just by completing the brown line, which is the risk-free rate. That's if you put money away for one year, you're going to get about 580-ish. The red line is the, oops, I'm sorry. The red line is the bond yield curve, and the blue line is by how much this red line has to go down to give you the same return as the brown line. You can clearly see that in this area, you need rates to go to a ridiculously low level of 4%, while there's some value at the long end of the curve. However, not a lot, and that's to do with the fact that a curve is sitting where it's sitting at the moment. So the break-ins are not very large, but on the short side, the break-ins are negative. So you want to be positioned not necessarily in a lot of bonds, but you want to be positioned in something that gives you an excess return. And I'll talk to you the portfolio in a moment. The other thing that we want is the budget. Now, this afternoon we have the appropriation budget, so I don't want to comment on something that I can leave myself open, but we expect the budget probably for this year to be okay. We expect them to have done some refunding. And that next year's budget deficit will be under pressure because we expect a low economic forecast, so therefore budget deficit is going to be under pressure for next year. Uh, the inflation rate, we're not going to comment much on the inflation, except I've said inflation unfortunately now has risen to 5.5%. We think inflation will perform well, probably stay around the 6% level for the next uh, couple of uh, months uh, as we head into 2013. Uh, this is a forecast from Kevin, and uh, it's maybe worthwhile to just point out one or two things. So the most important thing is, is our growth. Our GDP growth is now only 2.3%, and that's well down, and even next year is now below 3%. And that's not good news, because it's got impact on a number of things, of which the main one is government finance. However, we think inflation, as I've said, average 5.5% this year, 5.7% next year, and probably 6% in the year after. We all know that 2014 is up. I'm stuck. Why? Because we don't know where the oil price will be, we don't know where the RAND will be. There's a number of factors, but we do believe that this is a fairly um, comprehensive amount of work that Kevin does. Mm -hmm. He makes certain assumptions, and uh, he's been fairly accurate in the past about these forecasts. So where does it leave us? We think bonds will give you 8 to 9, income funds will give you somewhere around about 7 to 8, with a lot less risk, and then the money market uh, 5.5%. So in the process, and I'm just going to jump forward to one or two slides, in the process of the decisions that we take, there's a technical application that happens quarterly, there's a fixed interest rate meeting that happens every six weeks, where we talk about what's going to happen the next MBC, we talk about currencies, but the most important thing is every two weeks, we have a, what we call a technical application meeting on fixed interest. Now at that meeting, Keenan sits, Victor sits, Ian sits, Robin sits, Anzi sits. He talks to the money market, he even talks to profit. He talks long term and short term. Why? Because we might like the asset class in the long run, but we don't necessarily might think that asset class is well priced at the moment. So that will influence our short term decision, but we might potentially be 
full weight and hold it in the long run of the earth. So we took all the different asset classes, pull all of that together, and that view then gets smashed across all portfolios. So a portfolio that we talk about today with a 33% property benchmark will get the benefit of an overweight property position, while a portfolio with only 5% as property of a benchmark, as with property as a benchmark, will probably be going from 3 to 4%. So we'll go nearly full weight when we are bullish on property. So if I just can go back for a moment, and, and why is why <coughs> why is Standard so successful? <coughs> and this without being um, over the top, but the reality is Standard uh, fixed interest has got the top performing one year bond uh, in the country, the top performing three year bond fund in the country. So we have the best ability to add alpha to the bond block. In our income fund space, okay, the short term we're not doing that well, but it's very tight between the funds. Long run at the three years top performing. Our aggressive fund, the fund we're talking today, is the top of all the fund out of all various specialists. So there's no fixed interest fund in the country that is rated in terms of various others that is doing better than the aggressive income fund as it stands today. Then we've got either top quartile in all these property positions. So the building blocks that we're using, what I'm trying to illustrate, the building blocks that we're using are the best available building blocks basically in the industry. So Keenan's ability not only to make a property call, so you see that He's, he's, he's got such a large business, and he's really right up there. His ability to make the right call, but also to add value over and above the call that he's made is very really important to our business. Okay, so let's talk about the fund briefly. This fund, um, at the end of June, 38% property, now sitting around about 35, 36%. What we've done in this fund, we've included a number of linkers. Now, I don't want to give a whole lesson to everybody, but this is not inflation linkers, it's chai bar linkers. It's an instrument that's linked to the three-month rate. Now, if you buy a three-month instrument, it will probably give you about just over five, let's say 510. If you buy that same instrument from a, from a bank for a one-year period, so it's got a number of reset dates for one year, you'll get about 30 basis points over. Now, if, if you buy that same linker instrument from that same bank for three or five years, they'll pay you 135, 150 over. Why is that? Because banks are paying up to get longer money because Basel III is coming and it's forcing banks to try and get more, more money. So we put a lot of those linkers into this fund and fund very short dated bonds, high yielding short dated bonds into this fund. Over time, and this is mainly Kenan's input into the process, we've managed to move our property exposure. So remember I said to you this fund is a 33% properties, 33% cash, 33% bond benchmark. Where we like property, we move it up to, right up to 50%. When we don't like property, we cut it. In 2011, when we walked in here, there was a big change in sentiment. So we aggressively cut the property exposure from 40% to 25%. We realized, notwithstanding that what everybody was saying, that the markets were not going to high grade. And we can see that standard over the last basically two years have been running an overweight property position, which has certainly contributed to the very good performance of this fund. The other thing that we do is we run the bond position unconstrained. So that two-thirds in fixed interest we run unconstrained, which means that when we like bonds in 08, 09, we like properties, we went into the bond market. The all bond index at the time was four and a half years. We went right up to the index. Over the last couple of years, we all know rates have been coming down. We're in a sideways environment, so we buy short date high-yielding bonds, and we buy a lot of leaders at that point of view. So against an all bond index, at six, cash at naught. So you can see that the benchmark for the portfolio is three on average for the six interest portion. We're running the portfolio one and a half years. And that's quite defensive. Why? Because we're taking a lot of duration risk uh, in the property sector. And we're happy to do that because we think we can extract more value from that pool. What is important here for those of you that know our business well? This is a carbon copy of what we do for similar funds. So other funds will have exactly the same profile because that's the way we run our business. All funds with similar mandates get the same outcome. That's the process. Then, um, towards the end of my presentation, I think this is the performance. 20.5% um, a wonderful performance. But what is very important here, that stands to what has happened in the last year. It's an unbelievable story how well this fund has done, even if you look at the three and the five years over time. And remember, this benchmark challenges the fund managers every day to determine whether they want to be in cash, whether they want to be in bonds, whether they want to be in property. 
But the application of this fund is very simple. You can use this fund to pay income. As long as your time horizon, the fee is a number. Remember, there's a volatility factor in property, but property's got this wonderful advantage. And I don't want to talk about Kevin's area too much, but property grows over time. <coughs> well, we've got this highly defensive fixed interest position. You have a situation that you can probably extract 5 to 7% out of this fund and still see growth over time. What people sometimes also forget, I'm uh, not like a salesman here, but the reality is I use this in my own pension fund. Why? Because we always forget if you're in an annuity type of product, the interest that you accrue is not taxable. Just think about it, it's not taxable. So if you get 8 or 9% on this fund, and you act, remember it's not market movement, you get the actual money. It's money on money on money. So if you for 20 years have this type of product that's supporting your annuity where you don't pay tax on the interest, you will be very surprised to see how much actual money we've got. Because the risk of having assets that has price movement but not necessarily actual cash coming in is that those things are not cost uh, in terms of uh, the actual return that is sitting in the portfolio or the actual value that's sitting in the portfolio. So I believe this is not only something that you use as a building block where you don't want to choose between property and fixed interest, you say, well, let me give it to stand up to run my fixed interest for me. It's also a building block for a person who wants to say, I've got a three and longer time horizon, I want to draw some money, or I want to put this in my annuity because I know I'm going to get the return over time. Does Mr. Cameron know that? What? <laughs> I don't know. Does he know that? I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully he's got his money in there. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at the longer term. Remember, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying to you that this is without risk. We've had a wonderful year in property. If this is sell-off at once, property will probably take a bit of strike. Reality is that property has got a growth component which over a medium to longer term will protect you. So let's look over the last uh, five odd years. So there, the green line is that recent income fund. It's done phenomenally well. It has a lot of volatility in the IHO9. That's when we bought more assets for this portfolio. And similar with the bond fund. There was volatility at that time. The bond fund has done well, not as well as the aggressive income fund. You can see the income fund, income fund which is the red line, has done quite well. I know a lot of you are well invested in the income fund. Very interesting, and we have to point this out. Do you remember I told you in 08 or 09, money markets were higher than income funds. So there was a period when money market funds were better than income funds. No, we don't argue about that. But as we stand today, we have a normalized yield curve, so you've got to recognize where you want to position yourself on the curve. So, in conclusion, I think uh, we've got <coughs> best of breed, and that's the building blocks that we basically use for constructing the aggressive income fund, uh, which I really think is, is one of those rare opportunities to invest in something which you leave a difficult choice to somebody else to do for you.